The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. morning church i hope you're having a blessed day today today is going to be a very fun lesson i hope you're excited to join us today today's i believe part number 47 of our series walking in in purpose and today we're going to talk about be perfect we're going to talk about be perfect and this is going to tie directly into what we have going on tonight because tonight starts our advanced curriculum tonight's the introduction week of our advanced curriculum and the whole point of that curriculum is based off of Hebrews 6, verses 1 to 3, I believe, maybe 4, where it says, go on into perfection. So today we're going to talk about being perfect or be perfect. And the more I studied this, the more verses God gave me, the revelation just kept expounding and expounding. So we're going to try to hammer this out in one day, but we might have to take two days to fully explain this. So... I need to jump right into the lesson today. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion. Transforming us by the renewing of our mind. Conforming us to the image of Christ. Growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Even while I was sitting there just praying right now, the Lord started speaking to me some more. So let's jump right into this. Go with me to 1 Kings 17. I want to read this passage and I want to explain to you why the Lord is speaking this specific issue to me. And Elijah, the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a curse. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. 
And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. And after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the curse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sent his rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. She and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the curse of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Now, what's very interesting about this passage in 1 Kings 17 is that this is the start of the life of Elijah. And in the start of the life of Elijah, he becomes holy and he becomes perfect as he walks before God. Now, Elijah does not do everything right in his life. We will know that in 1 Kings 19, Two chapters later, Elijah makes a big failure. He fails pretty big when he runs from Jezebel. So Elijah doesn't do everything right in his life. But this is why we need to make a big difference right here on the difference between holiness and perfection. The difference between being holy or being perfect. And let's talk about the differences in the two. This is going to tie into what we talked yesterday about becoming resolute making a decision, making a heart position, and letting God empower you to walk it out. Becoming resolute is about becoming settled in a decision, in a heart position. We said it yesterday that you change your heart, God will equip you with the power to change your action. For so long, so many people have tried to change the action to influence their heart, but it always ends up in failure. You have to change your heart and then God will change your action. God will give you the strength to change your action. So we got to understand that there is first a difference between holiness and perfection. There's a difference between being holy or be holy and being perfect. So let's talk about the differences in the two. Like I said, I've been meditating on this all morning and praying about it as the Lord was just speaking to me over and over. So we're going to go to a couple different places and kind of just unpack this as we go. Like I said, we're going to try to do it all in one day. We might have to take two days just as God starts speaking to me as we go through it. So just hang on and let's, let's start to unpack this together. Let's begin at 1 Peter 1. Let's just start here. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that in 1 Peter, this phrase that it says it says it's written be holy as i am holy is the quotation out of the law so if you go back and read i believe it's in leviticus i think it's in deuteronomy also but definitely it's in leviticus inside of the law god says be holy for i am holy now that word holy means to be set apart so now we're starting to see a very big difference i'm going to define perfection in just a second but let's talk about holiness for just a minute. And what does it mean to be holy? The first part about this that I want to talk about is be. What be means is a state of being. It becomes a nature. It becomes a character. It's not just something you do. It's what you are. That's a big difference. Because you can walk holy or you can be holy. To be holy is the heart position. It's what you decide at the heart level. Walking out holiness, meaning that you fulfill all of the law, is different than a heart position of holiness. You might say, Cody, explain the difference. Okay, here we go. If I am holy, my nature and my character, if God says, be holy, and I say, I am holy, if I make that as my decision, what I have decided is in my heart, I have decided I am holy. And now the power of God, 
The strength of God comes on me to walk out holiness. Meaning that I decided the heart position. I am set apart. That's what holy means. To be completely set apart. Other than. Which means whatever the world does, I'm separate from that. That's what the law was for. The law was showing you that you could never attain it. You need the power of God. But what the law did is it made a stark difference between the people that walked as the world and the people that walked under the commandments of God. God says, you do this. The world says, we do that. And there's a difference. It sets you apart from the world. But to be holy is a state of being, not an action. This is one of the biggest things that we're going to unpack today. It's the difference between a state of being and the actual fulfillment of it. Because the fulfillment of it, the actual walking of it out, is very different than the heart position of being holy. So that's the first thing I want to talk about. And holiness deals with the actual works that you do. So holiness, be holy, means to talk about being set apart in the actions in which you take. It's all about what you do. You might say, well, Cody, how is that different than perfection? Well, let's go to this. Go to Matthew 5. We're going to have a lot of revelation come forth today. I'm going to probably end up having to watch my own sermon because as I prayed about this, the Lord just kept moving so many revelations to me. So as I'm speaking to you, the Lord is speaking to me at the same time. It's pretty fun, actually. But go with me to Matthew 5. Let's talk about this. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and send his rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You might say, well, Cody, what's the difference? Here, let's talk about this. Jesus said, loving your enemies and hating, or loving your neighbor and hating your enemies and how the world acts. Now we're talking about this outward action. That's, that's holiness. Holiness is what you do, being set apart. And Jesus says, we can talk about your actions being holy, but he says, I'm not saying your actions be holy, be set apart. No, he says, be perfect. So the first place we read talked about be holy in the context of your actions. But it's a state of being, making the heart position, God influencing you with strength to actually walk out holiness. But here Jesus is making a difference between the action and perfection. Now we see a difference between the two. Now what does perfection mean? Let's define this and then we're going to go to another spot that elaborates this even more. Perfection isn't having to do with your actions. That might be a big kind of setback for a lot of people. That might have set you back in your chair, but listen to me real fast. Holiness has to do with your actions. Being holy has to do with being set apart, meaning that what you do is different than everybody else. But being perfect is who you are. It's not what you do, it's who you are. It's a very big difference. Because the word perfect has nothing to do with outward action. Being perfect has to do with completeness. It's being complete in every area of your life. But it's being complete on the inside, the maturity, the growing yourself up unto perfection. So being perfect has to do with being complete in and of yourself. Being holy has to deal with what you do inside out. So there's a difference between holiness and perfection. Perfection has to do with being complete, whereas holiness has to do with being set apart. Holiness has to do with what you do. Being perfect has to do with who you are. 
And that's a very big difference. Go with me to Matthew 19. I'm trying to explain this pretty fast today because I got a lot of places that we want to go to. But in Matthew 19, let's go to verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which, Jesus says, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth, what lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. But when his disciples heard it, and they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? And Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now, this passage has been taught many, many times, but we've had some very misunderstandings of the teaching. For the main reason that people don't understand what camel going through an eye of a needle is. They're thinking about a 2,000 pound camel going through you know, a hole that big. That's not what it's talking about. The eye of a needle was actually an archway that led into a city and the archway itself sat low. So for a camel, being as tall as they are, to actually go through the eye of the needle, or the archway, they had to bow down. They had to pretty much get all the way to the ground and crawl through it. A camel going through an eye of a needle is not talking about a big camel going through a, you know, a one centimeter hole. It's talking about taking yourself to go through something and having to come low. It's talking about humility. It's talking about bowing down. It's talking about surrender. That's how you enter into the kingdom of God, not by what you did. Remember, the rich young ruler looked at Jesus and he said, I did all these things holy. My actions outwardly were this. But even though I was doing things outwardly that set me apart from everybody else, I was not perfect. You see the difference? Jesus looked at the man and said, be perfect. Even though he was already walking out holiness, he was fulfilling the law. He was doing the things that he was supposed to out of the commandments of God, to be holy. Remember, that's what First Peter, a quotation out of the Old Testament, dealing with the law. That's what the man said. I did all those things. It's talking about holiness. But Jesus isn't talking about holiness. He's talking about perfection. Because holiness deals with the outward action, whereas perfection deals with the inward heart. Jesus wasn't telling the man to do things more. You know, you're already walking out the law of God, just keep doing that. No, he says, change your heart. The same way the camel goes through an eye of a needle, you have to surrender the inward part of your heart. You have to give up your own will. Right? Remember, Holy has to do with being set apart. Perfection or being perfect has to deal with being complete. The man might have walked out holiness, but he wasn't complete on the inside. There was still something missing. Remember when I talked about being resolute yesterday? So many people try to change their action by changing their action. Just doing everything outwardly. But they end up failing over and over and over. Because it's not the outward thing that God is concerned with. Now, yes, does God want you to walk in holiness? Absolutely. God does not want you in sin. God does not give allowances for sin. But God doesn't look at you and say, do in and of your own strength change your outward action. The law was not given as a blueprint how to work your way to God. The law was given so you could realize there's no way to work to God 
which means I have to change the inside part of me, then God will equip me to change the outward part of me. This is a very, I mean, this, people would say this is what you call splitting hairs, but it's a very big difference. Go with me to James chapter 1. I'm running a little low on time, so we've got to speed up just a little bit. I've got one, maybe two more places that I want to read. But go with me to James chapter 1. Let's read these verses real fast. Verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like, a man, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he withholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, and being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now this is powerful, because I want to talk about a glass real quick. I want to talk about a mirror. Now, I've, I've heard many other pastors talk about this before, but it's very interesting to think about it. You cannot see your own face. You can't look, I mean, your eyeballs are in your head facing out. You can't flip them around and look at your own self. The only way you can see what your face looks like is in a glass. But here's the thing, there's different kinds of glass. You know, if you ever go to a carnival and you look at them fun mirrors, it'll stretch or pull out, you know, what the glass what you see when you look at a glass is what the glass tells you, not what you actually are. Because depending on the glass, depending on the clarity, you could see things that you don't otherwise see. It could be distorted. So when the Bible talks about looking at yourself in a glass, what it's saying is when you look into the Bible as your glass, what you see is not what you are. It's what it says you are. When you look at the Bible, it doesn't say you have brown hair and blue eyes. What it says is you are perfect and complete in God. That's what it says. When you look at the Bible, it says God equips you to walk out holiness. The law was not given so that you could find a way to God. The law was given so you knew that you needed God to change you from the inside out. The point of a glass is that when you see the Bible and you when you read your Bible, it's not telling you what you actually are. It's telling you what God says you are. That's a very big difference. And when we see that, we can go, flip with me real fast, go to Hebrews 5. It looks like we're going to be able to at least get all the verses in today. We might have to go back to it tomorrow, but let's read this real fast. Hebrews 5. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have exercised their senses both to, to discern both good and evil. Now, if you look at our advanced curriculum, we go into this chapter 6 where we read the next three verses. And that's where we wrote that curriculum off of, based off those. But 5 leads into 6. The point is, in 5 it says full age. Full age is also the same word used to mean perfect. The Bible says... That to be perfect is to have exercised your senses to discern both good and evil. Okay? Your senses is in your body. Taste, touch, feel, smell, hear. The five physical senses. To become perfect means to have trained your body to know the difference between good and evil. That you don't have to make a decision every time it comes to you whether you're going to do it or not. Your body already knows the discernment of the two and picks holiness. Let me say this. The way most people walk as children in the Lord, as babes, as people that are unskillful in the word, what they will do is they will go through life and they will encounter a circumstance. 
And then they'll have to make a choice. Do I choose righteousness and holiness? Do I walk in sin? And it's in that moment that they make the choice. Here's the difference. The people that are perfect before God are the people that are complete and mature. The people that are complete have already made the decision. They've taken the Bible and looked at it and said, this is what it says about me. And they make the decision at the heart level. This is how I am. This is who I am. I am perfect before God. And then when they get to that moment to make the decision, they choose holiness. They actually become holy. Because in being complete on the inside, it makes you holy, which walks out holiness and perfection. The difference between holiness and perfection is the difference between setting apart yourself and being complete. Once you are complete, you will be set apart because you'll automatically do it. You won't have to make the choice every time it comes to you. You will have already made the choice. Like I said yesterday, the difference is change your heart and then God will equip you to change your action. We're going to talk about this some more tomorrow because I've got so much more revelation on this I want to share and we're out of time today. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let this word come alive. It's wisdom revelation. Father, I thank you that you make us perfect. We become perfect and then you equip us to be holy. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day. Remember, if you're a part of our advanced curriculum, we do have class tonight at 7 p.m. And we will see you there. Other than that, church, we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Have a great day. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow Oh, the troubles to come The lily's not thinking about the seasons The drought or the flood The tree that's planted by the water Isn't phased by the fire So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care. Carry